All right, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Molly Bletz. So Molly is really among the pioneers of people who have been studying the microbial communities associated with uh, amphibian skin. So this is important because amphibians have been declining on a global scale for at least four decades. And one of the main culprits that is causing it is a couple of uh, skin pathogens, chytrid fungal pathogens. So Molly got started as a master's student at James Madison University, uh, trying to develop a protection for Eastern newts using probiotics. Uh, and then she did a PhD at the Technical University of Braunschweig in uh, Germany, working on amphibians in Madagascar. So Madagascar is, of course, this beautiful island country with uh, unique amphibian species that are found nowhere. And they were then and still are threatened if the chytrid pathogens um, become uh, come in and cause, cause declines. She then, after her PhD, she uh, uh, competed for and received the David H. Smith Conservation Postdoc. She worked at the University of, Boston, uh, University of Massachusetts in Boston and continuing to study lots of microbiomes of amphibians from lots of places. She is now a, uh, a scientist working with the U.S. Geological Survey at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. It's more in terms of sort of decision science and trying to develop uh, ways to actually put into practice ways to protect amphibians. She has more than 50 publications since 2013, and she's also the chair of the North American B-Cell Task Force, which is a, a multinational group dedicated to trying to uh, prevent and plan for if a chytrid fungus hits the salamander species. So with that, Molly, please tell us uh, your story. Well, thanks so much, Luis, for the introduction and, and inviting me to be here. I'm, I'm excited to, to chat with you all um, about various dimensions of microbes, um, stemming into some host immunity things as well. Um, oh, my com on my end, the videos just froze. Is everyone still able to, able to hear me? OK, great. Um, but so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here today. Um, we can talk about wildlife microbiomes and disease mitigation. Um, and to start, I just wanted to uh, uh, tell a little story. And so when I was an undergrad, we were out in the cloud forests of the Panamanian Highlands. It was our first night out um, to, go, to go herping. The rain was drizzling down. The only light that we could see was from our headlamps as it darted across uh, different parts of the forest. Um, and my, my fellow classmates and I were straining our ears, listening, listening for the calls of the frogs. We heard a faint whistle from the forest canopy, and then there, there was another species croaking on the forest floor. But there were only these two species. And I thought to myself, how could this be? I was in a tropical biodiversity hotspot. This is where the frogs are supposed to be. Um, but there were only these two. And later in our cabins, our professor told us what used to be that there used to be over 100 frog species calling from these trees and hopping around the forest floors. So the question that we all had was what had changed? Who or what had caused the frogs to disappear? And more importantly, what could we do about it? And it's that sort of motivation that still drives a lot of the research that I'm doing today. And so <clears throat> one of the main culprits of these amphibian declines in places like Panama uh, and around the world was these chytrid fungus, the Trachochytrium dendrobotitis, or BD for short, you can see it growing here. Um, BD is a pathogen that has motile spores uh, that can embed and develop in the amphibian skin. And as infection builds across the skin, it infects skin integrity and function, which can result in, in mortality in multiple species. And now there's also this newly emerged chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium salamandervorans, or B. sal, we couldn't call it BS, um, which is what I'll come back to uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But fungal diseases in general are on the rise, not only for amphibians. Um, there's white-nosed uh, 
syndrome in bats. We have sudden oak death in, in, in trees, rice blast disease, snake fungal disease, just to name a few. And so there's a common challenge of, of dealing with these pathogens, um, and it can be particularly uh, challenging in wildlife species. So within any host pathogen system, right, we have three main players. We have, in this case, the amphibians, the host, their habitats, the ponds and streams and forests, and then these Batrachochytrium fungi um, that are the pathogen. And it's um, various aspects of, of both the host uh, and the environment can, can amplify or dampen um, these pathogens and the disease dynamics uh, within, within the host. And so when we um, think about uh, this uh, host can, can sort of have different tracks uh, of where they would be going if they're infected with these pathogens. They might uh, develop clinical disease um, that can ultimately result in, in death. They might be tolerant of the, the pathogen, so they might be able to uh, be infected, maintain relatively low or moderate loads, but not really have any ill effects. Um, they might develop resistance, so get infected, build immunity and clear it, or be sort of completely immune or sort of a non-competent host, they're just not see they don't seem to get any infection whatsoever. And a large component of uh, the research that I've been doing has focused on the host side of this, particularly the microbiomes and looking at what role they play in Batrachochytrium infection uh, and disease dynamics. And understanding that relationship can sort of be at, at the root of driving innovative strategies to uh, shift disease outcomes. And so, um, Amphibians have three main uh, defenses. Uh, we can categorize them uh, sort of superficially, at least, uh, into um, their innate immunity. So Luis, of course, works a lot on, on innate immunity and antimicrobial peptides um, that are produced from the granular glands. We have their adaptive immunity. So that could be T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, production of specific antibodies, that dimension of sort of memory response. Um, and then we have their skin microbiome. And that's the bacteria that are living on their skin um, within that mucus layer, which we can see in this SEM picture, the bacterial cells sort of bedded in that network of mucus. Um, probably they're eating the mucus um, and then they're providing sort of defensive function um, via multiple different mechanisms probably. And so there's been an explosion in microbiome research in the last decade um, and showing that these communities have uh, uh, a lot of importance for pathogen protection, among other things. And amphibians and wildlife in general are increasingly being explored on that front. Um, and I think the unique thing about the microbiome is it's not uh, directly host produced. Um, and so I see your hand up, Seth. Yeah, I want, I want to ask a question here. Uh, Molly, if it's okay, does the mucus serve as a, a sort of demilitarized zone in the system or is it a zone of beneficial symbionts as well? Um, we know very little <laughs> about amphibian uh, mucus, and yeah. there's sort of some, so I, I guess the quick answer is I don't know. Um, but Sounds like something I, fun to explore. Yeah, um, and there's some research that, so Doug Woodham's a lab that I was just, uh, my previous postdoc has been looking into some ways to sort of create mucus and see how that changes different interactions and, and really understand what's, what's going on. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, but so, the, so these microbiomes or the microbes living on the skin are, are something that isn't uh, directly produced by the host. Of course, the host can play a role in, in shaping those communities. But um, it, when I think about the microbiome, it's something that we might be able to more easily manipulate. And so when thinking about moving towards management strategies, um, that, that's of interest. And so some of the early work, just to give some context about amphibian microbiomes, is... Um, and, you know, the microbes could be there, but be really not that important for the host. And so some of the early work out of um, Reed Harris's lab showed when we take away those microbial communities that they are, in fact, doing worse um, when exposed to pathogens like the chytrid fungi. And so apologies for the unlabeled axis here, but this is weight loss of the host. So this is um, plethodon cenarius, redback salamanders in the... Um, the first group here, that's when they have their microbiome intact. They're not getting the pathogen. Then we have their microbiome intact with the pathogen, take away their microbes, sort of strip them off, and then expose them. And we have a lot higher weight, weight loss. Um, this axis also seems to be backwards. But um, anyway, the point being, they're losing more weight. Um, and, and so those microbes do seem to be very important for the host. 
Um, and there's also been countless studies now that have cultured these amphibian skin bacteria. And we also maintain a database now of over 7,000 bacteria that have been cultured from amphibians and tested for their functional properties. And so we do know that um, at least in vitro that these bacteria can inhibit the pathogen growth, which is what we're seeing here. Um, we have the positive control of the, the pathogen growing happily and healthily. Um, and then two different bacteria, one of which the bacteria A basically has no um, impact on the fungal growth while bacteria B uh, strongly reduces growth. And it's something like that that could potentially serve as a, a probiotic or a, a benefit uh, to the host. All right, so, um, so given the role of these uh, microbial communities uh, in, in amphibian sort of health and protection against disease, uh, it's important for us to think about having an ecological understanding of these communities. And um, within that context, uh, there's sort of multiple questions related to both the sort of basic ecology side and then the applied ecology side. Um, and the, the research that I've been doing is um, mostly focused on these two arrows um, and looking at sort of what structure, what are the structuring forces of these amphibian microbiomes? How stable are they through time? Um, and then on the sort of interaction of the, the microbiota and the pathogen, which bacteria are providing defense and how does that protection vary across different species, across the landscape um, uh, for different hosts? And so if we just, we can start with this first question of what uh, factors are influencing amphibian uh, microbial communities, which is what takes us to the wonderful island of Madagascar. Um, and you might ask, well, why do you have to go the whole way to Madagascar to study amphibian microbiomes? There's some, you know, right outside. And that is true. Um, and, and many of my colleagues joke that we decided to work, start collaborations in Madagascar to, to go on a tropical vacation, right? can go uh, escape the winters of, of Massachusetts and um, be in the sun. But uh, if there are any field biologists in the room, you know that uh, field work, is not always a walk in the park. You can get your truck stuck in mud more than once. Sometimes you also get stuck in mud. Um, and in Madagascar, there's something called terrestrial leeches. So they literally rain out of the forest uh, uh, and, and show no mercy. Uh, with that said, this was not to deter you from Madagascar. It's an amazing place. Um, it has, we have a great collaborative team um, with amazing families. There's great cultures to experience. Uh, and there's some pretty amazing wildlife other than the frogs. Um, but there's also some pretty amazing frogs. So uh, as Luis mentioned in the introduction, Madagascar is a biodiversity hotspot for amphibians. There's over, I think it's now over 400 species that are considered to exist in an island that's about the size of Texas. <laughs> This is a lot of diversity in a very small area. Um, and ecological niche modeling has suggested that, that Madagascar is at risk uh, if these chytrid fungi would arrive. And so in this map, we can see uh, the, the red zone in the Eastern corridor of Madagascar is where it's climatically suitable for BD. And this is also where most of the frogs live. That's the wet uh, tropical region of Madagascar. Um, to date, uh, there's been no uh, major declines associated with BD. In 2015, we did find some evidence um, through DNA-based detection that the, the pathogen was present at a couple locations, um, it's, uh, but we haven't detected it since. So uh, it seems like whatever was there was either an avirulent lineage um, or it maybe didn't take hold uh, within the populations to be able to spread across the landscape. And so we, we still have this unique opportunity to think about uh, things proactively. Either maybe BD arrived and the frogs have some unique special uh, ability to protect themselves. And so there's a lot to learn there. Or um, the BD that arrived in Madagascar wasn't a virulent strain and it's just a matter of time before one of these uh, virulent strains does arrive uh, and causes damage to the amphibian communities. And so we can think proactively about uh, building innovative strategies for uh, disease mitigation. So uh, within Madagascar, um, I think this is, let's see, this is back to 2014. Seems like just yesterday, but I think our field work uh, for microbiome started in 2014. And we sampled over a thousand, uh, almost a thousand species across the eastern part of the, the country uh, and into the central plateau and uh, across eight dif 18 different locations. And we characterized the microbiome um, via targeted amplicon Illumina sequencing to look at what factors might be driving both 
alpha diversity and beta diversity of these amphibian communities. And so we we're interested in sort of whether host phylogeny or host ecology or site related factors were the, the main sort of drivers of these communities or which things were dictating the um, community structure. And what we found was that <clears throat> for both alpha and beta diversity, one of the most important things was host ecomorphology, which sort of sounds, um, isn't necessarily that much that, that informative in itself when you think about the word, but basically what that means is that it's, it's a complex of both the host life history. So where are they spending their most time? What are they doing with their life? Where are these amphibians going to breed um, in addition to the, their microhabitat preferences? Are they spending their time in a tree versus uh, on the forest floor uh, in a stream? And so it's, it's a combination of those things. And that's what we're looking at here graphically with this bipartite network. We've just grouped our uh, data into three uh, ecomorphs of arboreal, aquatic, and terrestrial species. Um, and then the black nodes represent uh, the most uh, dominant uh, bacterial families. They're connected with edges. And so those lines are weighted based on the bacterial abundance. Um, so a thicker line means more abundant, thinner line, less abundant. And what we can see um, here is that there's particular bacterial groups that seem to be associated with particular ecomorphs. We have the Alcaligenaceae being strongly associated with arboreal frogs, um, the Viroca microbiaceae, <clears throat> and the Comomonidaceae for aquatic frogs, um, Acetobacteraceae, and the Chitinophagaceae for um, terrestrial frogs. And so we have these unique um, bacterial species uh, or bacterial groups on uncertain ecomorphs, but we also have a lot of common things. And so I think we tend to look at differences, but there's also a lot of common bacteria. And if we think about um, working towards probiotics, it might be those shared bacteria that are sort of easier to think about adding to a, a diverse community of frogs. And so those things that are sort of falling in the, um, the middle of the plot here, the weak salaceae, the sphingomonidaceae, um, might be uh, interesting directions for probiotics. And um, so next we're gonna sort of fly to a different place of the world uh, in Germany. So, uh, and, and think about uh, the microbiomes of German amphibians. And so I did my PhD in Germany. Um, and so I couldn't spend all my time in Madagascar. And so we did do some work with, with German frogs and newts. Um, and this allowed us to sort of tease apart um, that, that host and environment, um, uh, the host and environment aspects of, of what's driving community assembly, because in, um, in Germany or also in the United States, it's easy to find multiple species sort of in the same pond at a certain time of year when things congregate to breed. And so we studied two different frog species and four different newts uh, at two different locations when, when they're all co congregating to breed. So we're minimizing any habitat variation and minimizing any seasonality of, of sampling them at one point in the year versus another. And what we found was <clears throat> that frogs and newts differed in their skin microbial communities, but there weren't uh, d apparent differences between in, uh, the species within those clades. So in the PCO here, you can see the orangish yellow uh, frogs clustering. Um, I don't know if that's the right or left for you guys uh, on the, the one side of the graph and the, the blue newts clustering on the other side. Um, and proximity of points here, right, is similarity of the um, communities. So when the points are farther apart, they're more distinct microbial communities. And so this clear se separation suggests there's some structuring force that's causing newts and frogs in the same pond to have different microbes. Um, and this could be due to presence of things like antimicrobial peptides being much more commonly found in frogs. Um, and then there's other proteins and alkaloidal compounds that are uh, produced by newts that could be acting as structuring forces. Um, and some anecdotal evidence just connecting this in with chytrid infections is um, <clears throat> newts within these systems are often um, not infected with BD while frogs are typically infected. So potentially these compositional differences also uh, could relate to their uh, infection dynamics. And um, sort of teasing out these frog and newt microbiomes a little bit more, we can identify different uh, bacterial taxa from the communities that are um, sort of differentially abundant um, between the, the two hosts. And so here's just uh, two examples from each group. We have a, a Acinetobacter species and Pantoa bacteria from, from frogs, and then 
uh, Pseudomonas and an Oxalobacteraceae species that were much more abundant um, on, on the newt species. And those two uh, groups, Pseudomonas and Oxalobacteraceae, are, um, when we culture those from amphibian skin, are members that are, are typically uh, inhibitory uh, against BD. All right, <clears throat> so coming back um, here, these, these studies in both Germany and Madagascar have sort of expanded our understanding of these communities. We know that both host and environmental factors are important uh, in driving community assembly. Um, but all of these studies were, um, sorry, um, uh, snapshots uh, in time. And so we're only looking at one time point. Um, and so that tells us little about the variation of the communities through time and how stable those communities are through time. And that's pretty important when we think about the, the functional side of these communities. If, if a community is varying structurally, what are the functional implications of that? Uh, and so in the uh, data we are looking at with Madagascar and German frogs, uh, German amphibians, we are looking only at who is there and at what relative abundance, um, but, but also not looking at um, but not looking at what they can do. And so um, what we, we did within that German system again was um, temporally sample individuals through time for two different newt species um, and characterize their community and also predicted uh, their function uh, to, to basically allow us to look at uh, whether there's a potential, um, is there our function or structure and function behaving similarly or are, the, are those aspects uh, decoupled? Um, and so we sampled uh, the smooth newt Lysotriton vulgaris as free swimming individuals who are sampling a, a different subset of individuals at each time point. Um, and then we did a mesocosm experiment where we essentially put pop-up hampers in the middle of ponds that house newts so we could repeatedly sample the same newt um, and sort of uh, get away from the fact that uh, we, we didn't know if it was the same individual each time. And what we found for both of these species was that the community structure uh, significantly varied through time. And so here we've sort of taken the PCO axis values and plotted it in two dimensions on this plot just for simplicity. But we can see there's major shifts in the, the community happening in early April uh, and then also in, in early May. But uh, when we look at the functional side, here we're predicting uh, BD inhibitory function with um, a database that we curate, which I'm happy to get into the the weeds of those methods, um, but we're, we're using the illuminate data and sort of blasting it against our database to, of known inhibitory members so we can have a proportion of the community that has uh, predicted BD inhibitory function. And when we look at that, we aren't seeing uh, drastic changes through time. And in fact, it's not, it's not significantly changing through time. And so we have <clears throat> a, a decoupling of structure and function here. Structure is varying, uh, but the function is remaining uh, relatively constant. Um, and so it seems that these, while the communities are having turnover or changes in relative abundance of given members, they're maintaining um, pathogen protection, protecting functions. Okay, <clears throat> so coming, coming back here again, <clears throat> we, we looked at uh, those, those structuring forces of amphibian microbial communities, looked at um, their stability through time, um, but we're also interested in this uh, interaction of the microbes uh, and the pathogen directly, which bacteria are providing defense um, against, against BD and how that protection is varying across the, the landscape. <clears throat> and this is, um, understanding these questions is uh, ultimately linked to this idea of can we uh, mitigate chytridiomycosis, <clears throat> the disease caused by um, by these chytrid fungi through probiotic bioaugmentation. Can we add beneficial bacteria uh, to the skin uh, to minimize pathogen growth? Seth. Yeah, so among the analyses you did, it sounds like you looked for a host phylogenetic effect on the microbial communities. And, and so how much of a percent of the variation is explained by amphibian phylogeny? Um, so in, how much? Uh, I would have to get back into the weeds of these. Uh, yeah, um, but basically, when you for the Madagascar data set, where we have a lot of different species, we 
we created a phylogenetic proxy by, um, by creating an NMDS variable, basically, of, of the, the host phylogenetic tree. Um, and when we ran that in models uh, with uh, the, the host ecomorphology, host ecomorphology was always significant and host phylogeny wasn't significant. And I, I think um, skin microbes are super variable. Um, and so uh, we... I'm not talking about this uh, today, but we also have a, a study where we looked at skin and gut microbial communities of amphibians, and we see a strong phylogenetic signal in the gut microbial communities, but it, it really doesn't, um, uh, we looked at sort of topological congruence of like the, the host phylogenetic tree and the different microbial uh, dendrograms, and there's basically no pattern with skin, but there's a strong pattern with gut. Yeah, great. So if there isn't sort of a skin phylosymbiosis pattern, then maybe that makes it more susceptible to being changed by, you know, probiotic augmentation. So that's, that's good that there's not a yeah. 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 Thanks. Yep. Um, and so let's see. This, I, so I think I've, I'm, I don't remember what I, what I said yet here, but um, so this idea of, can we, can we manipulate the amphibian community, uh, microbial community to sort of shift it to a, a protective state um, through the addition of probiotics? <clears throat> And probiotics are, are pretty common, right, in humans now. We, we all eat yogurt. We are buying into this idea. There's probiotic supplements out the, out the wazoo now and implementing it in agriculture and livestock settings. But for, for wildlife, it's relatively, um, re relatively new and, and can get a little bit more complex in, in thinking about this uh, in, in natural systems. Um, and, and when we think about probiotics, it, coming back to this diagram, you know, we were interested in sort of pushing species or pushing individuals out of this clinical disease track. So can we modulate their microbiome in some way that they become tolerant hosts, that they become resistant or immune? Um, or maybe we also want to sort of push tolerant hosts out of tolerant and, and down into resistant or immune because we don't want uh, tolerant hosts out there just like spewing zoospores um, into the environment that can infect other, other inhibient hosts. With that said, promoting resistance and uh, complete immunity might um, also mess with pathogen evolution, and we'd want to be thinking about that in uh, the context of any decision making with probiotics. Um, <clears throat> and this sort of gets that to uh, relates to Seth's uh, recent question, but um, you know the idea with probiotics, uh, at least in my mind, is that can we sort of shift the mucosal protectiveness to this alternative stable state? Of, um, of high protection by, by adding um, probiotics uh, into the community. And that might happen um, through different ways. That could be direct effects of the colonized probiotic. So you establish this very abundant, helpful bacteria within the community. Might be through immunomodulation. Maybe the bacteria gets there and actually makes the um, antimicrobial peptides do something different or uh, interact differently. Um, and provide defense. Or you could have microbial modulation through uh, competition. So you add this bacteria that, this other bacteria that's already there really hates and it produces this antifungal thing as a consequence. Um, or community turnover where you would have sort of a, this sort of keystone species idea of something coming in and sort of shifting the community to a different protective state. Um, and so, uh, that conceptually, that's sort of the idea we're thinking, we're, the ideas we're thinking about with probiotics. And so coming back to these, these questions of which bacteria uh, are providing defense and how they vary uh, across the landscape um, is gonna take us back to uh, Madagascar. So while we were sampling in Madagascar, we also collected culturable microbe samples. And so we, and we cultured over 3000 bacteria uh, from the skin of amphibians and challenge those bacteria against uh, BD, against the chytrid fungus. So determining whether that bacteria is able to inhibit uh, fungal growth. And this is a phylogenetic distribution um, of the bacteria we cultured. The majority is actinobacteria, which is in blue, but there are also firmicutes, bacterioides, and um, multiple different um, uh, proteobacteria. And so but ultimately sort of what we're interested in with these bacteria is they're, what they're doing, right? The function that they're potentially providing. And so 39% um, of all the bacteria uh, in, exhibited inhibition against BD. Um, and there wasn't any overarching sort of phylogenetic signal of this function um, across uh, the groups that we isolated. But it, 
definitely is, um, the function is varying across uh, different taxonomic groups. So looking here um, on the top, we have the actinobacteria. Um, there's inhibitory members uh, everywhere, um, but there's less inhibitory members uh, within the actinobacteria. But we see sort of high um, amounts of inhibitory members, which is represented by the black portion of these plots um, in the uh, bacterioides and the uh, proteobacteria. In particular, we have the Enterobacteriaceae and the Pseudomonadaceae uh, and the Xanthomonadaceae having more than 75% of their members showing strong inhibition uh, against BD. <clears throat> and um, we also used uh, that culture-based and uh, functional data to, to look at how bacterial protection uh, varies across the landscape. And so uh, here, it, we're going to bring in the idea of herd immunity, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, especially given we're in a pandemic. Um, but the idea that a certain percentage of the population, you know, is vaccinated against the disease, the disease will die out. Um, typically, this percentage is based on the R-naught of the pathogen. Um, but uh, if we just think conceptually for a second, a lot of diseases can fall around 80%. So if we think about um, an 80% threshold, um, in our systems, and we're gonna pretend that vac vaccination equals the presence of these BD inhibitory bacteria. And so if you, if you have these um, beneficial inhibitory bacteria on your skin, you're, you're vaccinated or you're protected. And so um, we do that, we have the, this hypothesis of 80% you know, of the community uh, <clears throat> has to have these inhibitory bacteria, and then it's going to be protected against developing uh, chytridiomycosis, the disease caused uh, by BD. Uh, and this is what we found um, in Madagascar. And so there's multiple amphibian communities that um, are, are reaching that threshold. So they have more than 80% of their members um, having inhibitory bacteria on their skin, while there's other communities um, that are falling short of that threshold, suggesting they might, you know, if we, we think about this, these are the those communities that are falling below might be the ones where probiotics are most um, needed because we need to sort of boost the protection uh, of the community. Um, this is, of course, only looking at one dimension of uh, host immunity. And so um, the, this isn't the only tool that we can use, um, but it's a first step at sort of looking at uh, variation across uh, the landscape in Madagascar. And so <clears throat> where we are now with the Madagascar project is um, sort of working on experimental trials with different probiotics and uh, looking at if we add selected bacteria, uh, inhibitory bacteria, or mixtures, so sort of community probiotics to these hosts, do we see a, a shift in mucosal function, uh, which we can assay in an in vitro um, assay uh, and, and not have to do exposure experiments. And so this is what uh, Victoire is a master's student uh, in Madagascar. And so in, in 2020, um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we started these projects. Um, and this is just a, <clears throat> a snapshot of what we've found so far uh, with two of the species. I think she has over 10 species in her trials. Um, but with Bufus pyrus, both of the uh, single and mixture probiotic uh, didn't seem to have any mucosal function benefit. Um, but with the Mantodactylus betsilianus, we see that that single species probiotic is um, significantly boosting mucosal function um, for the host, uh, suggesting that it could have a protective effect um, for the host if it was exposed uh, to BD. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, um, our work in Madagascar uh, focused a lot on the, the microbial interactions with this first chytrid fungus, uh, BD. And, um, and, and the idea of working towards mitigating BD-associated uh, chytridiomycosis, um, which is majority, for the, for the most part, is causing declines in frog popula populations around the globe. Um, but if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned this other chytrid fungus, um, Batrachochytrium salamandervorans, or B-cell. Uh, and B-cell has recently emerged in, uh, has an Asian origin, uh, it recently emerged in Europe, uh, specifically in Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany, and it's uh, wiping out uh, predominantly fire salamander populations, but also other, other newt species uh, that exist in Central Europe. <clears throat> um, and, and both of these are chytrid fungi, but they clearly have different uh, host specialization, and so there's potential different interactions that are happening, different um, 
mechanisms of host immunity that could be at play uh, between these two different pathogens. Um, and as I mentioned, this pathogen um, is thought to have it, its uh, native uh, ranges in Asia, and it's thought to have arrived in Europe via the pet trade, um, and then uh, potentially have uh, spilled over from from the pet trade into wild populations. And, and so it's only really a matter of time before the same thing could happen with the United States. Um, and, and the US is, is actually the world's uh, biodiversity hotspot for salamanders. We have over 50% of the world's salamander diversity within the United States. And actually a lot of that is in the state of Tennessee in North Carolina, down in the Southeastern United States. And so there's, um, we have a unique opportunity here um, to, to build ecological and immunological understanding of, um, of this disease uh, uh, in these salamanders before there's any uh, massive die-offs. And a lot of the research with BD uh, was, was chasing after the problem. Uh, and we do have this chance to be proactive here, similar um, to sort of our mindset with Madagascar. And that's what a big group of us are doing. Luisa is part of the research working group of the B cell task force, but it's a bunch of in, uh, universities, NGOs, uh, government organizations uh, coming together to really not only understand uh, things from a science perspective, but also develop policy um, management actions, legislation for wildlife health. Um, and this network has been great to work with. Uh, uh, and I'm excited to sort of continue with this group and, and really hopefully make make a difference, <laughs> sounds cliche, uh, for B-cell uh, and uh, salamanders in the US. And so <clears throat> on the research side, uh, I've mostly been working with um, the Eastern Newt, um, which the life cycle is shown here. There's an aquatic adult species that lays eggs that um, uh, hatch and develop as little larvae. And then they uh, metamorpho metamorphose into terrestrial Fs, which wander the forest for anywhere from like two to 10 years before they come back to the water to breed. And this is a focus, focal species of my uh, David H. Smith uh, postdoc uh, that I had in Boston. And <clears throat> uh, within this system, we're interested in, in many different things, but two things I'm gonna highlight today are looking at understanding how um, the host microbiome responds to pathogen infection, and then also working towards identifying and testing strategies that can shift disease outcomes for um, these salamander species um, and exploring sort of combination actions, not necessarily just looking at probiotics, but are there sort of synergistic tools that we can build um, to um, promote positive health out outcomes. And so <clears throat> the, the work for this started with uh, doing a, a field survey from Georgia um, up into Maine and sampling new populations. Um, and uh, we did, there's a lot of a field data associated with this, which happy to talk about afterwards. Um, but um, here, what I'm highlighting is that the, the populations with the dark circles are ones where we collected individuals and uh, Kate McDonald did a, um, a cross-population uh, B-cell exposure experiment with these, with these different populations uh, to understand how uh, susceptibility might differ across that landscape. And during these experiments, we were able to look at the microbiome. Um, and so she, she took microbiome samples at two weeks post uh, B-cell infection, uh, and we can look at basically how the pathogen is shifting um, the, the microbiome across populations. And so <clears throat> uh, we, we did both 16S and uh, ITS, so looking at, so 16S looking at the bacterial community, ITS looking at the fungal community of these newts. Um, and uh, for the bacterial communities, we actually, we use this new tool that um, Doug Woodham's, John Wood and I developed that's a, a plasmid spike in. There's also commercially available ones now, but we can spike in this plasmid standard uh, into our microbiome uh, PCRs, which allows us to get estimates of, of true abundance. Um, we, can, we can do that bioinformatically basically after we get uh, the sequencing data. And so for those that are familiar with Illumina analyses and sort of microbiomes be inherently compositional in their you can only really look at relative abundances. Uh, this sort of takes us out of that um, compositional space and allows us to really look at uh, true abundances. <clears throat> and so the, 
Um, first thing that we found was we were just able to get this estimate of bacterial abundance, right? And, and so for the B cell exposed, which are in the, the yellow, um, there's a significant increase in the bacterial abundance on the skin uh, compared to the control hosts. And uh, for the purposes of today, we're looking at everything together. We're not looking at each at the populations independently. Um, and then when we looked at OTU richness or sort of an estimate of how many different uh, types of bacteria or fungi are there, um, we see that B cell exposed newts are showing a reduction in um, bacterial OTU richness, but an increase in uh, fungal OTU richness, which of course we've introduced one new member at least with uh, the Patrachochytrium being in the community but that the increase in the fungal uh, richness is, is more than just uh, the addition of B cell. And from a, a compositional or a microbial community structure perspective, we're also seeing a big shift in communities with um, both the bacterial and fungal community. Um, <clears throat> with Again, the yellow are the B cell exposed, um, sort of going to the, the left side of the plots um, with the controls um, being distributed on the right. And another interesting thing with the fungal community is you can see the controls are sort of much tighter knit. So there's less difference or sort of dispersion within the communities com compared to the exposed. So that could imply that there's maybe some dysbiosis in the fungal community because the communities are, are much more variable. <clears throat> um, and, and coming back to the, that plasmid spike in I mentioned, so we're able to look at differential, uh, differentially abundant bacterial OTUs um, and not just from a perspective of relative abundance. Um, and this is just a snapshot of, of four. We see um, the Ocrobactum bac bactrum and the Stenotropomonas being more abundant on B cell exposed individuals. Um, and this Arcobacter and uh, Fusobacter being more abundant on control organisms. And <clears throat> one interesting thing here uh, is the Stenotropomonas, because uh, that's also been, that's also come out in a few other studies. So. In a study we did on fire salamanders, um, a standard tropomonas OTU is also found to be more abundant on B cell exposed individuals. Um, and a study by Bates et al. with two different newt species um, also found standard tropomonas um, to be more abundant on the B cell positive individuals. Uh, and, and Doug uh, Woodhams and I are currently lo uh, leading a, a meta analysis with a bunch of grad students at UMass Boston looking at sort of um, different, like how, it, how is microbiome, how are microbiomes being shifted as a result of, of BD and B cell infections? It'll be interesting to see if, if Stenotropomonas or other OTUs pop out uh, in an even broader context in thinking about these chytrid fungi. Uh, and within these uh, B cell systems, as I mentioned earlier, we're also interested in implementing uh, disease mitigation strategies. So um, managing wildlife populations is going to require thinking outside the box and sort of developing innovative solutions um, that can capitalize on promoting both sort of host immunity, minimizing environmental sources of the pathogen, while also making sure we're thinking about non-target uh, organisms. We don't wanna be um, helping the salamanders and killing all the fish or um, other organisms within the ecosystem. So there's multiple avenues that we can uh, pursue we can think about boosting adaptive immunity. So we can think about um, vaccination of newts. Can we, can we prime their uh, immune systems in that way? Um, can we reduce environmental suitability? So can we um, uh, adjust abiotic parameters, increase temperature, increase salinity um, in aquatic habitats, or maybe we can introduce uh, micro predators. And so um, things like Daphnia, rotifers, um, and some other zooplankton um, are predators of, of, these zoo, of, the, of the zoospores of BD and B cell. So we could think about uh, boosting or augmenting those communities uh, to reduce that environmental zoospore pool. <clears throat> and so the work that we've done, oh, and of course probiotics, I'm forgetting about the microbiome side here. We are um, interested in the idea of, of thinking about, can we increase those beneficial bacteria on the skin? Of course, can we shift the microbiome into a, a more protective state? Um, and so we did experiments with two different life stages of newts. Um, one of these is the, the larval um, side is still ongoing. So I present, I'm presenting where we are so far, um, but we did a disease mitigation trial with both aquatic newts uh, and the larval stage. Um, 
Of course, within a lab setting, we're not doing anything with B cell out in the real world. Uh, and so for the adult trial, uh, we are looking at um, three different uh, sort of tools, the, the idea of a probiotic, these micro predators. And then we worked with a nanoparticle engineer um, and Christina Rodriguez was a PhD student um, who certainly made the nanoparticle vaccine uh, possible because I know nothing about nanoparticles other than they are very, very small pieces of something. And so we are using very, very small pieces of um, uh, PLGA and we are, they're inherently sticky. And so we can sort of stick B cell proteins um, to these nanoparticles and they can sort of operate as a vehicle um, for de delivering the vaccine. And they're small enough that they can actually travel through um, intercellular junctions like sort of into the host uh, via a, a skin bath. So we don't need to think about injection and things like that. And so um, for the new experiment, the, the adult experiment, the uh, timeline is at the bottom here. We, we vaccinated, gave them two weeks, then did a booster vaccine um, gave them their probiotics and then exposed them to B cell, looked at survival through time and also swabbing them regularly to, to look at pathogen load. And what we found for survival <clears throat> was that none of the single treatments, so I guess one thing I didn't mention with those treatments is we were looking at them both singly, but then also in all possible pairwise combinations. So putting a probiotic and the vaccine together, putting a probiotic with the micropredators um, and things like that. And, and what we found was that um, the single treatments, so one, one strategy by itself didn't seem to, um, well, didn't at all increase survival. But as soon as we paired any of the actions together in either a two-way or a three-way design, we have a significant increase in survival. And I'm particularly interested in this sort of vaccine plus probiotic and, and maybe what might be going on there um, in, that, in that synergy. Uh, which also links into the, the larval experiment, which I'll chat about in a second here. Um, but again, the take home here is that it seems like we need sort of combination strategies to, to really make this work. Uh, and so we did uh, this idea of this factorial experiment also with larval uh, newts. Um, an important thing here is that the larval stage of the newt is actually not in fact, uh, cannot carry B cell infection. It's only once they um, sort of metamorphose into the terrestrial F stage that they become susceptible and then they're also susceptible as adults. Um, and this has to do with sort of what's going on in their skin. It's hypothesized to do with keratin levels and things like that. Um, but what we we're interested in here was sort of, can we implement these disease mitigation tactics as uh, when the individuals are larvae and have that actually transition to something meaningful after metamorphosis, because um, it's certainly very hard to wander around the forest and find Fs and treat them in any way. But if you think about doing this in the real world, larvae are at least all present within ponds, and so they're easier to access. Um, and so uh, here, uh, because um, we're exposing individuals to B cell at that terrestrial stage, we dropped that micro predator treatment because that has to do with thing, little organisms swimming around in water, which wasn't relevant uh, here. But we, so we have the probiotic and the vaccine and we developed two different types of vaccine this time, uh, which basically just have different protein coatings. Um, one that's derived from the ex sort of extracellularly secreted proteins from B cell and one where we essentially, essentially put spores in a blender, <laughs> sort of anything that might be in or on a spore is coating the nanoparticle. All right, so we are vaccinating at the larval stage, which is what you see here in the little cups. And um, they're again, getting a booster like the adults where we're giving them the probiotic before they leave the water. Um, then we have sort of this period of metamorphosis where you have these adorable little newts that come out of the water. Um, and we gave them a little bit of time to sort of grow up, um, have their skin sort of fully transition to terrestrial life we expose them to B cell and then we're monitoring survival and, and B cell loads through time. So we're at day about, um, oops, there's a, that's inconvenient there. This thing's not supposed to be over the plot. You'll have to believe me of what's behind the box. Uh, but, but again, that's sort of the interesting thing that we're seeing here is, uh, 
the same, a similar pattern to what we were seeing with the adults. So all the lines that you're seeing down here are the single treatment um, vaccine and probiotic. They're, they don't seem to be boosting survival um, in themselves. But when we, this, this line here is the, the vaccine plus the probiotic. And so that combination treatment, again, seems to be sort of the key in getting us to see any increase in survival through time. And we're at about day 120-ish for this experiment. We're going to hopefully continue through day, uh, day 200 at least. Um, but so the, the thing that's overlaying the, the survival plot here is just sort of one of the things I'm interested in with that combination of, um, of vaccine plus probiotic is, is maybe it's that the probiotic is giving them earlier protection. If we think about um, uh, an invading zoospore, they're going to sort of find the, the skin mucus or the, the skin surface of a newt. And the one of the first things they'll en encounter is that microbial community that's there. Um, and then maybe they embed in the skin. Um, the, the adaptive amphibians are super slow at doing anything with adaptive immunity. Um, and so it might take a while for that to kick in if it kicks in at all. Um, and so maybe the probiotics providing earlier protection, it could even go away um, and decline in abundance. Um, at later dates, if you had this sort of increase in the host immunity, which might be our host produced immunity, um, which is coming from the vaccine. So completely just a hypothesis. We haven't explored anything um, about mechanisms for this yet, um, but it's sort of an exciting direction to go in. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I think with that, I would just like to thank Millions of people, of course, science is not done as an individual at, at all. It's always a group effort. Um, and there are countless people that need uh, thanking. And of course, they've made the work a lot more fun. Um, and of course, funders that make, make the work possible. And with that, I will take any questions. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, if anyone wants to raise their hand and then uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Sergio. Hey, how's it going? Great talk. Thank you so much. Um, it was, yeah, it was phenomenal. It's a really interesting project. I'm curious, you've identified a couple of probiotics and you're working on figuring out how effective they are right now. I'm curious, have you taken any like synthetic biology approaches trying to edit or in, in like input some sort of gene that may be able to help you? Is that a, an approach you've taken? Um, personally, no, but uh, community wise. Yes. So, um, Matt Becker and, um, the Smithsonian zoo have done a lot of work with, uh, Panamanian golden frogs, which are extirpated from Panama as a result of the BD and trying to figure out solutions to get them back on the landscape. Cause they have all these captive assurance populations, but like as soon as you put them back right now, they just die again, um, because they have no immunity. And so, um, they had done some trial, have a lot of sort of failed trials of what microbe might be the, be the best. And they were having issues with the microbes, not sticking, not staying as community members. And so what they decided to do is they, they cultured bacteria from the Atalopus, from the Panamanian frogs, uh, and found a common species that was a Comomonas, I think. Um, and then took the, um, violacine, uh, which is from a, bacteria called Janthanobacterium lividum, which is a, a BD inhibitory metabolite and sort of inserted the gene uh, in. Um, and I think, I, I think it's published now. Um, I, I think they didn't end up having much success there either. It seems like um, probiotic, Luis, maybe you remember or are involved in it more. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting dimension to think about, um, of course, with the complications of convincing people that a genetically modified thing is acceptable when the idea of bacteria usually scare the people that I talk to uh, about any of this in general. But yeah, it's a cool direction. Thank you so much. I actually have a, a short follow-up question and it's mostly yeah, to do with introducing this, this probiotics. Do you think that you know, increasing their abundance either on the skin or the gut of, of the amphibians will have an effect on the, on the you know, fungal members of their microbiome? Do you think that perhaps will throw everything off on the other end? Yeah, it's a good point. And so are we um, looking at those sort of community interactions, I think is important. Um, you know, and I mentioned non-target effects from the perspective of like the, the environment around, but I think that also applies at the sort of micro environment scale of, okay, yes, maybe this probiotic uh, increases in abundance and helps uh, with, with BD, but you've 
you know, taken away these critical fungal members, then you made it worse, you know? And so those, I think another interesting direction is just fungal probiotics. So we've spent a lot of time on bacterial, focus on bacterial species, but maybe there are, um, you know, fungal inhibiting fungi. <laughs> um, I mean, we know there are, but uh, hasn't been explored in, in detail with amphibians. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, I think Dante, you may have had your hand up next. Do you want to unmute yourself? I'm not. I'm not able to hear right now. Is are other folks? Dante, we hear you now. Uh, you're up for your question. If you can ask them. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. There, yes. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Uh, sorry, the, the microphone wasn't working. I was just wondering if anyone has ever done like a cold culturing of these probiotic bacteria with the pathogen and seeing how they react with one another. Because um, I feel like it's just an interesting aspect of how, um, like how the, the, these probiotics, they just like, they're out competing them or, or are they producing any kind of antifungal um, molecules that might be prohibiting the, the colonization of, of, of the uh, frog's skin or the amphibian skin? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Sort of what, what's the mechanisms that, that could be happening? And um, so I guess the first thing I'll say is all like the work that I've done has been sort of solely focused on like the chemical potential um, sort of warfare, if you will. Um, so we, we sort of extract the, the cell-free supernatant from bacteria, so whatever chemicals it's producing or small uh, molecules. And then we're assaying that against uh, the fungus. And so we're only looking at that dimension but I will say that there was a recent paper, which is in my folder of to read that I got an alert recently out of Valerie McKenzie's lab in Colorado, where they were using some type of sort of synthetic matrix to, you know, separate out the bacteria and the fungi because bacteria outcompete um, BB or B cell like instantly in a culture um, and you'll just have bacteria, but developing sort of a, some type of matrix that allowed them to like interact in different ways that so they could get at ideas of like space competition and, um, nutrient related things in addition to the, the metabolite side. So that doesn't fully answer the question necessarily, but I think there is research out there that's going that direction. And then follow up question for when it comes to the different species in different locations, is there just like, uh, uh, do the microbiota of, for example, the Germany versus the Madagascar, are there <clears throat> significant differences between the, the microbiota? And if, there are, um, do those microbiota present like a, like an area of susceptibility for, for the pathogen? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of differences um, when you go from tropical to temperate regions and, and what microbes are there, or at least based on what we know from 16S sequencing. Um, so I think... I'm not sure if this is directly answering the question, but, you know, there's different things we could look at it. You know, are those differences, the, the reason, let's say that tropical amphibians are more susceptible than temperate amphibians to BD. Um, but I think the other thing we can think about is like, are there, and well, I, you know, when I think about probiotics, I usually think about, you know, we're thinking about locally derived probiotics and increasing abundance of those members because it, people freak out when you talk about moving microbes around, um, which is a valid <laughs> consideration. Um, but, you know, so we're not necessarily thinking of like taking a bacteria from a, a German amphibian and saying, oh, hey, maybe this will help a, a Madagascar frog and doing like trans translocations in that way. Um, but yeah, I don't, I hope that partially answered the question. Okay, I think we should take two more questions. So Alejandro next, and then Sarah. Okay, so yeah, I think it was more flawed with Sergio's second question. So I was wondering, like, you know, these bacteria have an inhibitory effect, but could, I don't know, like disrupt some interactions in the microbiome of the host. Like this host has never had this bacteria before. I don't know if that could, like, instead of have only positive effects, like have negative effects. 
Um, yeah, so just to make sure I'm understanding, you're saying when we introduce a probiotic, that probiotic could have sort of negative interactions with the microbial community um, that affect its well-being. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, like affecting okay. negatively. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think, I, I guess coming back to one of the, I, like the idea that we're looking at with probiotics is, is not necessarily introducing something that's like hugely foreign to the organism that we, we would, we're just looking to increase its abundance. Um, and so we're potentially, for example, like in the last, those uh, trials with newts uh, that we were talking about, that pseudomonas bacteria is originally isolated from newts in Virginia. And so it's something that they should have seen right before in their lives, which, which might minimize those potential sort of, hugely negative interactions. But of course, it's always possible that by, by creating this situation of sort of dominance of one bacterial species, we, we've got to be on the lookout for, for the sort of non-target effects of that uh, process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sarah. So my question's a little more on the practical side. Do you think that, you know, you do this once um, you vaccinate them, that there's a possibility you'd have to go back and revaccinate or reintroduce probiotics maybe when you see an outbreak start to kind of keep it down? Or do you think this is something that might be maintained long-term in a population? Um, yeah, no, another great question. Um, it, I, I mean, it would be great, right, if we could do this one time and, and problem solved, right? Um, I think the likelihood of that is is probably probably slim. And when we, you know, if we think about probiotics for a second, not necessarily the vaccination side, um, you know, when we've conceptually sort of brainstormed about it, you know, are there ways to create sort of self-disseminating systems that um, if we're using probiotics, one way that we can add probiotics is through environmental bioaugmentation. So we might add it to, let's say, an aquatic breeding habitat um, then the aquatic larvae, the aquatic adults that are traveling to those habitats can potentially pick it up, be transmitting it amongst each other um, versus needing to go out on the landscape and catch every single frog, every single salamander and give it a little uh, probiotic bath, you know, essentially put it in a cup with some probiotics. So um, I think that could increase the feasibility of probiotics. And I think the interesting thing with the nanoparticle vaccine is that some of that same philosophy can apply, not that they would transmit the vaccine between each other like you can with probiotics, but the idea of pond application, because this is something that's absorbed through their skin. Um, it's, it's not um, an injection-based uh, delivery system. And so, you know, I sort of say jokingly sometimes that, you know, we spray things from airplanes um, for controlling insects. Why can't we sp spray vaccines to help the frogs or something? But, you know, it, we do do sort of ridiculous things sometimes to deliver uh, different sort of bio control situations or there are airdrops of bait based vaccines for, for large mammals. And so it, you know, convincing people to do it for amphibians uh, might be a hard sell. Um, but yeah, the, I guess, or just some of my thoughts, but it, it definitely will be a challenge and it, it is not uh, an easy, easy answer. All right. So a little bit after the hour, I think we should thank Molly again for a great presentation. Really interesting stuff. Thank you, Molly. Well, thank you again for the invite. It was great to, to chat with you all. Glad you joined us. Awesome work. Thanks.